So we're going to talk about parables and, and then the book of Acts. Um, what is a parable? Trace the, the roots of parable to Jewish wisdom literature. Uh, and, um, you know, Jesus spoke a lot in or taught a lot in parables. In Mark 4, verse 34, uh, scripture says he did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So Jesus spoke and, and taught in parables. Uh, and so what is the purpose of a parable? Well, it's, it's intended to teach. And that's the word didactic is the parable is intended to teach. Now, the question is, what is it that Jesus was teaching in, in telling these, these parables? So let's, let's kind of look at that. Uh, and we'll be in Matthew 13 and we'll, 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 um, we'll see what is it that Jesus was teaching through his parables. And then we'll look at rules of interpreting parables. So in Matthew 13, verse 31, Jesus tells them another parable. He's, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all, all, all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was, so was, fulfilled, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter, these, I'll utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now this... This um, expression, I'll open my mouth in parables, is, is, quoted, is a quotation from Psalm 78, verse 2. And I'd encourage you to please read Psalm 78. It's a pretty long psalm, but it really is very helpful to understanding what is the, what, what's the reason behind Matthew quoting Psalm 78. The gist of Psalm 78 is that it's the history of God's people, including the failure of God's people to be God's people. And Psalm 78 ends in verse 68 to 72, which is very telling. It ends with, in, by saying, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established for heaven. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with the integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. So when you look at Psalm 78, it, within the context, this hidden things that the, prof, the psalmist spoke of, or the prophet spoke of, is that the shepherd king is coming, who will rule or shepherd his people with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he would lead them. So that's what the psalmist is speaking of. So if I go back, you know, in Psalm 78, verse 2, which is quoted in Matthew 13, uh, it says, I'll open my mouth in parables, I'll utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Well, what's hidden is this reality of the shepherd king who will come and and, and shepherd God's people um, wisely and well and skillfully. So when Jesus uses parables, he's, he's teaching this new reality that the king is coming, which would be himself. He's coming and he's bringing the kingdom to rule just like was prophesied in Psalm 78, the Davidic king who will rule God's people skillfully. So parables are not earthly stories with heavenly meaning. Maybe you've heard that expression. Now, let me just say this. If you, if you hear someone else say that from the pulpit or something, try, please don't just jump on their, you know, just don't jump down their throat and get all upset and say, oh, let's know we, what we were learned in school of missions. And uh, <laughs> please don't do that, you know. Um, 
but here's why it's dang, it, it's not it's um here's why it's not helpful to think in the in this way that parables are just earthly meaning i mean earthly story with heavenly meaning because this description reduces parables to the platonic vision and by platonic i mean plato's vision if you don't know who plato is he was a greek philosopher um and uh you know who's who basically said that matter is evil the soul is pure and what's the and the and the problem is that the soul is trapped within the matter or within the body and so the best thing for the soul to do is to fly away to, to escape this bodily prison and then you know it will be great now that's not the biblical vision now you might be wondering hey i've heard that before i've, I've heard christians say that i just want to go to heaven and my soul's going to go to heaven when i die and what are you saying? Well, that's not exactly a biblical vision. Heaven is important, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, Genesis 131, God created good creation. And so the idea of escapism, that we're going to leave earth and we'll go somewhere else, is, is a platonic vision. The biblical vision is new creation, new heaven, new earth. Okay, and um, and so the problem with this thinking that we will just oh parables are just earthly stories with heavenly meaning is it can reduce parables to this picture of you know it, it's just about getting to heaven it's just about you know it's not nothing to do with what's happening in reality in real time on uh, in the present moment whereas the parables are about God's breaking uh, God's kingdom breaking in into the present world, into the real time, right now, in the midst of pandemic, right now, in the midst of uh, unrest and everything that's happening in the world, the parables are actually subversively saying God's kingdom is breaking in. So notice the diametric opposite of this meaning that we can sometimes give parables, that, oh, they're just earthly stories with heavenly meaning. You know, it reduces, again, the parables to some kind of platonic vision which doesn't really help okay any kind of escapism doesn't really help uh that's just that's just fact you know if you want to escape into alcohol or drugs or pornography um that's not going to help if you're just going to escape into heaven um one day and not worry about what's happening now that's not going to help any kind of escapism is not healthy and the bible doesn't teach that it doesn't say we should escape into something it actually says the kingdom of god is breaking into the present time and we are invited to be participants in the breaking in of the kingdom living so it's highly subversive as you can imagine and so parable invites the listener and the reader or the reader to this new reality it challenges the listener or the reader to live by this new reality and that is jesus's vision of kingdom of god jesus's new world vision and that's what the parables are they they are stories or they are um uh they, they are they're pointing to something that is here in the midst of the old calling the listener to make a decision to choose to either be part of the new thing or not be part of the new thing, new thing that Jesus is doing. So let's look at parable of the sower. It's a parable we're familiar with, but we'll look at it uh, hopefully um, with new lens that can give us uh, insight and, and can help us. Um, so starts with verse three. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. 
when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So let's look at the canonical context of the parable of the sower. So let's look at Isaiah 55, verse 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed, check this out, for the sower and bread for the eater. Now, the context of Isaiah 55 is that this is about covenant restoration. And you can read this in verse 3. It's a call to repentance in Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. It's a restored joy and peace in Isaiah 55, verse 12. And it's creation renewed in Isaiah 55, verse 13. And guess where the, power, where, the, where the sower sits? The sower sits in the middle. In verse 10, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. In other words, Jesus is saying the restoration that was prof, uh, promised in Isaiah is happening right now. But unfortunately, so many don't want it. In fact, three out of four don't want it. But those who do will bear ridiculous fruit. And he right calls it a politically incorrect message. So again, the parable of Saul really points to this subversive message that God's kingdom is actually coming it's breaking into this present world. But unfortunately, 75% uh, of people don't want it. And there's the 25 that do, the 25% will, will really bear great fruit. So now let's look at the vertical reading of the gospels, okay, of the, of the parable of the sower. So we, we saw the horizontal one, uh, which you guys worked on. So let's look at the vertical. So where does parable of the sower sit in vertically? Vertically is you're looking at it in the same gospel. So if you look at chapter three in Mark, you, it starts with Sabbath healing controversy, then the healing of the crowd, the appointment of the 12, then the accusation that Jesus is the prince of demons, rejection from his family. Okay, and then it goes into these kingdom parables, the parable of the sower being the first one. Then it goes into, the G, into Jesus calming the storm. And then it goes into chapter five, Jesus defeating the legion, Jesus raising Jairus' daughter, and G, Jesus healing the woman who's bleeding for 12 years. So the parable of the kingdom and the sower sits within chap, between chapter three and five. Now, Matthew, he places the parable um, between chapter 12 and 14. In chapter 12, it's the Sabbath controversy, but this one has to do with eating um, grain or the, eating um, on, on Sabbath, where you know Jesus and his disciples, they pluck grain and they eat and they get in trouble for it. So that's Jesus, um, again, in, in Matthew inv invoking the, ex the episode from King David's life, because that's what Jesus even says. Hey, do you not know what King David did? He also um, ate on Sabbath. In fact, he took food that was consecrated and he, because him and his, and his followers needed, were, 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 were hungry. And so there's the Sabbath controversy. Then there's Jesus accused of being prince of demons. Then Jesus saying, he is the sign of Jonah. And then there's the rejection of the family. And then all of chapter 13 is the kingdom parables, Sower and, and, and the others. And then Jesus is rejected in his hometown. And there's a little side note of John the Baptist. Uh, and then it's the Jesus feeding the 5,000. And then Jesus walking on water. Now Luke places the parable between chapter 7 and chapter 9. Now chapter 7 is the faith of the centurion. Jesus raises the widow's son. John the Baptist's disciples are 
asking if Jesus is the Messiah. They're not sure. Okay, they're not sure if this is, if Jesus is the one or if someone else is going to come. And then Jesus is anointed by the sinful woman. So it's very interesting. The, the, the disciples don't know if he's the one or not, but this sinful, sinful woman is appoint, uh, anointing him as king. Then is the parable of the sower. Then is redefining family. And then is Jesus calming the storm, defeating the legion, raising Jairus' daughter, and then healing the woman bleeding for, for 12 years. And then it's Jesus sending out the 12, feeding the 5,000. Peter uh, declares Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus' is transfiguration, and then the cost of following Jesus. So again, the vertical reading gives us a great perspective of where the parable is, is, is placed by the authors. And it really can, it, it brings out the, the highlights, the, the kingdom parable uh, and the power of Jesus, the rejection of Jesus, the controversies that are caused, but the king is bringing his kingdom evidently, like it's clearly evident that his kingdom is breaking in to this, to this world. So the rules of interpreting parables, we spoke about the hermeneutic triad. So again, it's so, again, reading the parables, helpful to know the history, literature, and theology. So you're not just doing one or the other. Um, consider, the, again, the canonical reading. We saw this the, the, when reading through the Gospels. Read the appropriate pericope. Again, looking at the sections of passages, and then read it carefully. For example, a Good Samaritan parable, um, Jesus I mean, the, the parable is told by Jesus because of a question posed to Jesus. And so reading carefully will help us to know why is Jesus telling this parable, gives us an insight into the parable itself. As I mentioned, reading it both horizontally across the parallel accounts in the gospels as, as well as vertically. So uh, determine the original intent of the parable. Is the parable of the sower uh, first century farming techniques. No, there's an intent that Jesus is telling the parable for. And so again, finding out what it is. How do you do that? By looking at where it's placed be before and after. Um, where is it? You know, what's he saying? Uh, what's this main point he's trying to bring across? How would the original audience hear it? The original Jewish audience hear it? Um, and, and then how would the early church look at the same thing? Does it, does it uh, have an impact in the life of the church? So these are, these are questions to, to consider as we read the parable. Consider the emotional texture of the parable. And, and I'll get to the next, um, oh man, I'll get to the next point of what is the parable doing? But look at the emotional texture. Does, these are stories in, 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 in some of the parables, are not all, of, all the parables are stories, right? But some of them are. They're intended to produce emotion in us, like the parable of the lost son. Um, or, or for the matter, the parable of the lost, lost coin, lost sheep, lost son, it invokes something in us. It's supposed to. So look for the emotional texture. Look for the surprising endings or reactions, because that itself can give us insight into what is Jesus teaching through his parable. Like the prodigal son, what is supposed to happen to this young man who says, I want my inheritance. Well, in that day and culture, that would have been a controversy. And, and the, the legitimate response his dad should have uh, given him is get out, beat it. You, you, you know, because the son is in effect saying, drop dead, give me my money now. I don't want to wait till you die to get my inheritance. I want my inheritance now. So the, the father should have beaten him and kicked him out. In fact, should have taken him to the village square where all the villagers would have gathered and beaten the kid because the kid was being um, disrespectful uh, and perhaps even stoning them if they really kept to the mosaic law because he was really being disobedient. But he doesn't. He gives them, gives his son and it's a surprise. It's, it's like, what does that mean? What, what, is he, what is Jesus telling us about the heart of the father? That's what he's, trying, he's, he's presenting uh, through the story, a, the, the heart of God. 
he lets his son go. And then there's the reaction of the, the first son, the oldest, oldest son. What is Jesus saying through that? You know, and, and who is the who is who in the zoo? Who is the young son? Who is the father? Who's the father? And who is the older son who is now re refusing to acknowledge the return of the young son? How would a first century Jewish audience hear the, so the story of, of a young son returning from a distance? They would have picked up the story of Israel, Jacob, right? He, he, he's now coming back from a foreign country where he's feeding pigs. Who feeds pigs? Well, the Gentiles do. So that would be a story of Israel's return from exile, which Jesus is saying is happening in and through his ministry. But then there are those who are opposing the good news of return from exile. So who are the older brother? Who's the older brother? It would be the Pharisees. That, that is, again, even Luke 15 starts out with um, the Pharisees saying, hey, why does Jesus sit and eat with sinners? That's the, that's the uh, situation that then prompts these three parables. So looking for the surprise ending and, or the surprise rea or the reactions can help us to see the lessons that Jesus is teaching through the parable. And then what is the parable doing? Because like I said earlier, the parable is intended to invoke a response. Either we're going to submit to the kingdom breaking in or we're going to reject. But we cannot be neutral. We cannot be sitting on the fence. We got to pick. We got to pick our sides. And that's what the parable demands from us, that you got to pick a side. Either you believe Jesus is breaking into the, Jesus' kingdom is breaking into the present time and you will then uh, respond or you don't believe it and you won't respond. That's, the, that's what the parable is invoking. It's, it's requiring us to make that, that decision.